One, live. <laughs> stand and begin doing that.
Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you for the empty grave. Thank you, Lord, for the risen Christ. Thank you, Lord, for that victory once and for all in time and eternity that frees us from sin and, Lord, amends us into your forever family. Thank you, Lord, for loving us first. Thank you, Lord, that this day we can meet together here and online to worship you in spirit and truth and not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Lord, thank you for all of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Please have a seat. <clears throat> Good morning, church. It is good to see each and every one of you here this morning, and it is good to see all of you that are online with us this morning. And uh, we're praying for you and praying for all of you that are going to be watching later. But for the moment, just go ahead and open up your Bibles, if you will, to the Word of God, and we will have Scripture this reading uh, this morning that comes from the Psalms, and it is the 19th Psalm. Open your Bibles to Psalm number 19. That will preach. I've done it before. Hear the word of God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eye. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord, uh, judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, amen. <coughs> Please stand again as we count our blessings in the Lord. It's a trick question. You can't really count them all. <laughs>
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings of life. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for our church and our church family. As we give that back, may we, we be all in and give back a part of what you have given us. Bless the gift and the giver. May all these gifts and offerings be used in your honor and glory. These blessings we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Brother Ned, thank you, worship team. You all do a fantastic job serving the Lord. Amen. And it is a joy to be a part of that in this church. Truly. I'm going to go ahead and find my passage this morning instead of 
digging around for it like I did last week. <laughs> Getting lazy, I'm not marking my Bible. I, I, you know, if you look at my Bible, it's marked in a lot of places. I could open it up anywhere and God's Word would suffice, amen? Nope, one more. One more. If I get loud, my technical engineer down there will make sure that I am not so loud. I was made aware, and I've always thought this, I've gone back, and it's never a good thing as a preacher to watch yourself preach. They tell you to do that in college, they say, you should watch yourself preach so you can improve on your, you know, on your technique, on your, you know, the homiletics, the art and style of preaching. Um... And um, I've gone back and watched myself, and it, I've asked my wife, I said, do, do I seem mad to you lately? Do I seem angry? And she says, no, you seem passionate. Well, Wednesday night, somebody asked me why I was so angry last Sunday. <laughs> so if, if I seem angry, it's not really what it is, it's passion. Sometimes I'm angry. I'll admit that. I, I have my faults. Uh, everybody does, but... Uh, so that's just a, that's just to throw that out there before I even get started this morning because the message I have for you the Lord has led me to give is it, it's going to touch on some issues and, and it needs to and it always needs to like I said God's word is sufficient no matter where you open the Bible um, so let me start with a piece of history this morning I want to give you this do a little teaching this morning there was a time and I'm thinking if I if I have my dates right and I believe I do somewhere around twenty. <coughs> 800 years ago, 2,800, right around in that period of time, God's chosen people, the people that God had, had picked out to tell the world about Him, okay? God had picked a certain group of people, not because they were great. If you read the scriptures, it says, I didn't choose you because you were great. I chose you because I chose you, Okay? And he chose them for a purpose, and that was to tell the world about him, about his glory, about his mercy, about his grace. And these were God's chosen people. But something happened in that time period, about 28, I think about 2,800 years ago, maybe a little bit more. But anyway, something had happened. And God's chosen people, which were once one group of people, became divided. They split right down the middle. They had, and in fact, in some theological circles, it is called a civil war. And there's nothing, and I know this sounds like a joke, but there's nothing civil about war. That's, that's a, strange, a strange term to me. But they had a war. They became divided. So instead of being one group of people, they were two people in two kingdoms. You had the north. Sound familiar? You had the north, northern kingdom, and you had the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was called Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. And they were split. And they had not one king leading them, but two kings leading them. And the reason for this was, is because, and here it is in a nutshell, sin. They weren't together anymore because of sin. They had become rebellious toward God, toward His will. They had become sinful and sinful to each other. Now, at that time, one of those kingdoms had already been taken captive by a group of ungodly people. That was Israel. They had already been taken captive. They were no longer their own group of people. They were in subjection to an ungodly group of people. And very shortly, that the, the, the southern kingdom was about to be taken captive by an ungodly group of people. So the prophet Isaiah led of God 
wrote these words, and it's in the first chapter of Isaiah. You don't have to turn there. The emphasis is going to be on one verse in that, in that little passage I'm going to share with you. This is not the passage we're going to. This is just to, to, to get you to understand what's going on. Because I want you to... Do you not... What I just shared with you, is that doesn't that sound familiar? Does any of that sound familiar? That's so, so what, what we're saying that what we've seen in history, that what we see today is not a new story, is it? Anyway, Isaiah wrote these words, and it was meant for one group, but actually both groups would have read it. And he said in Isaiah 1, chapter 16, or 1, verses 16 through 20, he says, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Verse 18, come now. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Devoured with the sword if you rebel. The emphasis in that passage is on 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Our loving and merciful God, even at that time of civil war, of disobedience of his children in the midst of saying, clean up your acts and guess what? I'm going to wash away all your sin. I'm going to wash away all your sin. I'm going to solve this problem. Why? Because I'm God. In that verse, there is a word that says reason. Let us reason together. This is God speaking to his people. Let us reason together. The sense of that word from the Hebrew means to decide or draw a conclusion by joint reasoning. Reasoning with God. Can we reason with God? Yes, we can. But know this. Your argument will not outweigh his. You can't win. There is no counsel against the Lord. Amen? Amen. But he says this. Let us reason together. The word reasons draw a conclusion by joint reasoning. The actual definition of it out of a dictionary is the power of the mind to think, understand, and form judgments by a process of logic. In fact, this one dictionary says there's a close connection between reason and emotion. I disagree. Emotion is emotion. Reason is reason. There might be a connection. You might, your emotion might be affected by reason. Maybe that's what they mean. But the truth of the matter is reason, reason itself, reason comes from God. Reason comes from God. Genesis 1 and 27 says this, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We, children of God, people of the earth, God's creation, anybody that's listening right now, understand this, regardless of what science tells you and evolution tells you and other people tell you, God's word says... That we were made in his image. Amen. That doesn't mean that we look like God. No one knows what God looks like. Moses tried to look at God and got a severe sunburn. I would recommend you look that up. His face shone so bright he had to keep it covered because nobody could look at it. And he only saw the backside of God. 
We don't look like God. We're not powerful like God. We're not all powerful. We're not omnipotent. We're not omnipresent. We're not everywhere. We're not definitely not all knowing. I can see that from many people's uh, social media posts. But we were made in the image of God. What that means is, is that we have the ability to think logically. We have the ability to reason. <clears throat> to reason. Everybody has the ability to reason made in God's image. God was so merciful and loving and wonderful and kind that he didn't make automas, auto automatons and robots. We have the ability to reason, and so we don't have to live without reason. Some people choose to be reasonable, and some don't. Man, some don't. There is a passage in the Bible where Paul talks about God gave them over to their reprobate minds. Yes, you can ignore God and just be given over to sin. Those people are hard to reason with. But some choose and some do not. But believers, however, believers, Christians... Those who have accepted Jesus, not just as Savior, but as Lord. That goes hand in hand. Accept Him as Savior and Lord. People who have done that must be reasonable and willing to reason. So whether there is a pandemic or protest, or division, or disagreement. There is only one answer, and that is to reason, and the answer to reason is the gospel. The only way anybody is going to get out of the trouble in this world is the gospel. Yet there are those who think that they are not in trouble. Maybe they're not living where trouble is. It's not around my neighborhood, not around my house. I'm not worried about it. There are some who are doing things that are troublesome that don't think they're in trouble. But either way, without Jesus, everyone is in trouble. Without Jesus, everyone is in trouble. So regardless of the circumstances... It is time for reason. And reasoning must start with the gospel. This, this, if you get anything at all today, our conversation, regardless of the issues, regardless of the trouble, regardless of the problems that come about, because they never seem to stop. They never seem to stop must start, our conversation, Christians, believers, must start with the love of Jesus, the gospel. Am I passionate enough for you this morning, or am I angry? <laughs> Amen. Amen. When Jesus was in the flesh on the earth, doing the Father's will, he came to bring love and mercy and salvation, and he always Started with, if you've never checked it out, check out the, the first four books of the New Testament called the Gospels. means good news. Man, we need some good news nowadays, don't we? It's right there in the first four books of the New Testament. It's good news. And guess what? And you go all the way through the New Testament, all the way to the end, where it says amen, that's good news too. But Jesus always started with the good news. He started with the gospel. And this morning, the Lord has led me, I believe very much so, to share with you one of the, one of the best of those instances in Christ's uh, life here on the earth where he started with the gospel. Open up your Bibles to the gospel of John. Chapter 3. Man, I don't hear any who's out there. You know what chapter 3 is, right? Amen. Amen. Gospel of John, 
chapter 3. And if you don't know that chapter, we need to have a conversation. <laughs> Maybe we need to counsel. John chapter 3. Let me start with verses 1 through 7. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. That's a great name, Nicodemus. I don't know why people don't name their kids Nicodemus. I'm going to name my next cat Nicodemus. <laughs> the wife says, no. There's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee. That means truthfully, truthfully. The word verily is the Greek word for truth. Truthfully, truthfully, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Strange thing, Jesus, you tell me. How can he enter into the second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, again, truthfully, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. You must be born again. Point number one. Only three points today. Everybody said amen. amen. <laughs> Point number one. Reason. Reason. Remember when I talked about the conversations we have. Reason. The first part of the conversation, no matter what the situation. Reason. Point number one. You, all of you, myself, all of us, everyone on the planet ever took a breath. Reason. You must be born again. Born again. Jesus is explaining to this man, Nicodemus, what it means to be born again. If you look at the chapter, Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. He is a Pharisee. History tells us that he was not just any old everyday preacher, any old everyday theologian. He sat on the council of the Sanhedrin. He was a brilliant man. He knew the Bible. He knew the scriptures. Yet he didn't know who was standing in front of him. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which meant he was kind of like on the, the Jewish Supreme Court. But he doesn't understand spiritual things. And that's because he has knowledge of the scripture and it is only head knowledge. Head knowledge is not enough. Head knowledge is not enough. That third verse, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You can read this all day long Every day, 365 days of the year, and not get it because you're not born again. You have to be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God because it is a spiritual awakening. It is a spiritual rebirth. What he says, what is born of the flesh, flesh, flesh is temporal. Flesh is temporal. It gets old. It decays. It will turn to dust. As much as I like to exercise and like to eat right and get sunshine, I am living proof. If I am a science experiment on the life of a human being, I have news for you. There was a point where everything was great, and now not so much. Everything that is flesh will turn to dust. Flesh is flesh. There's only two people in history who have not died. Yeah, by the way, the two people who did not die. One's name was Enoch. That would be another great name for a cat or a child. Nobody, I don't really know any people named Enoch. 
And the other one is Elijah. I know people named Elijah. <laughs> cool names in the Bible. Enoch and Elijah didn't die. Enoch walked with God. How, man, how cool was that? They were talking one day, walking along. God said, my house is closer than yours, and why don't you just come here? And Elijah, he went out in style. He went up in a chariot of fire. Those two people did not die. But everyone else will die. Flesh will decay. But what is born of the Spirit... See, the Spirit is eternal. So you have this birth in the Spirit. You have this new life. And by the way, it is not a reformation of the old one. It is not patching up the old life to make it look better. It is a brand new Spirit. Old thing. Listen, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. New spirit. Can't really renew that flesh, not just yet. That's another passage in the Bible that comes later. But the spirit becomes new. It becomes refreshed. Everything else that is old and ugly and nasty should be gone. New spirit. And we get this spiritual understanding by being born again. Reason. Reason. Be born again. What Jesus is talking about here, being born again, requires something really special. Repentance. Just repentance. And by the way, repentance is not a work. It is not something that you do upon your own. It requires repentance. That means to turn away from, turn away from sin. He says, "Be born of the water and the Spirit." It's not the act of water baptism. When he says water, he's really talking about you've got to be born in flesh first, and then you must be born in the Spirit. But it is this act of repentance through faith in Christ, which allows us to enter and see the kingdom of God. And it comes from, not from what we do, but from grace. And it is only a grace that God can give. And it is a grace that we must, Christians, believers, reflect to the world. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, you have a Bible like mine. There's a semicolon there. By grace you're saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It's not my faith that saves me. It's His faith. I just accept it. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the grace of God brings this spiritual rebirth, this gift of being born again, not of works, not self-help books, not doing good. Yeah, we need to do good. We need to build treasure in heaven, but just faith. Faith. Born again. Reason. Born again. Verses 18, or 8 through 16, same chapter. Listen as the story progresses. Jesus tells Nicodemus, this very brilliant man, man with all this head knowledge, he says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born in the Spirit. That means you cannot see the wind. You can't see where it comes from. You don't know where it goes. Basically, we're not really sure how it gets there and goes. Whether man can do that, based on pressure and this and that and everything else, but the average everyday person, Jesus says, it's the Spirit is like the wind. You can't see it. You can't tell where it goes. It just is. And Nicodemus says, well, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto them, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? You've got a master's degree, and you don't know what I'm telling you. Verily, verily, there he says it again, truthfully, truthfully, I say unto thee, we speak of what that we do know and testify that what we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? 
And no man is ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. I love that statement. That is not on my notes. But do you hear what he's telling Nicodemus? I've been there. I've been here, and I'm still there. Nicodemus should have, man, a flag should have went up for him. Verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man lift it up. He was talking about the way he was going to die. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Point number two, reason God is love. This is the true nature of God. God is love. First John 4, 8 says, for God is love. This is who God is. He is love, and he loves his creation. He offers the gift of redemption, that is salvation. He wants you, he wants us, he wants Everyone, and regardless, regardless of their sin, out of the grasp of Satan and turned away from the pit of hell. He wants everyone, everyone, everyone to have that, that gift that no man can give another, and it is that, that gift that only comes from God, that is the gospel, that is the good news, that is eternal life, the salvation through Jesus Christ. That is who God is. Reason. God is love. Look at that 16th verse. If you don't know that 16th verse, man, if you're a Christian and you don't know that 16th verse, Let's talk later. Go home and write it down over and over and over and over until it becomes a part of you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. God is love. This is who he really is. And it says so right there in that verse. For God so loved the world. God so loved the world. He loves the world. With, and it's in there. That word love is that, that Greek word that keeps coming out of theologians' mouths. Agape. Love. That unconditional love. Unconditional love. No restraints. No prerequisites. I don't have to do anything to gain God's love. God so loved the world. What do I have to do to earn God's love? Nothing. He already loves you. Love. Agape love. Just love. And we know this because that same little verse says this. He gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son. I dare say that anyone in here, in their right mind, would give their child to save the world. We have a selfish love. We don't want our children to die. We wouldn't get, I wouldn't give my son to save the world. Neither one of them. But God did. That's the love of God, the unconditional love of God. Remember, Christ, God sent Jesus to the earth, and on his way to the cross, he was completely enveloped, covered in, carrying all of our nasty, dirty, filthy, gross sin that separated us from God. All this disgustingness was on him. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. The perfect sacrifice. The thing that was talked about in the Old Testament. The unblemished lamb. Truly an unblemished lamb. Without sin. 
born of a virgin, had to be. God has a wonderful plan. He knows what he's doing. Made him to be sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was the substitutionary atonement. We gave nothing for that gift. We gave nothing. You give nothing for it. God gave his very best that we might live. In fact, he turned his back on his son. That's why Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? He knew God wasn't there that day. Can you imagine what it would be like? I cannot imagine what it would be like to be beaten beyond recognition, barely hanging on to life, being mocked and spit on, and hanging there, and the one that loves me most is not there. He's turned his back on me. Why? Why would you do that, Father? I can't imagine my dad turning his back on me. Especially a loving dad like that. Why? Because God is holy. See, we don't get holy. We are never going to get holy. I, I mean, we're going to get holy. Eventually, through the blood of Jesus Christ, and, and when, we're, when we're renewed completely on the, other, on the other side, but God is holy. He couldn't look on the sin that Christ had become for us and he loves us. He loves you. He loves everyone so much that he gave Jesus Christ in our place. That's the cross. Yeah, oddly enough, that's the gospel. That's the good news. Reason God loves. God is love. Reason God is love. And that salvation that was there in that moment, in that time that became available, that grace that happened at that moment is not just for certain people. The passage says, and you should have it highlighted, circled, big star next to it. Why it's not in all capital letters, I don't know. Whosoever. Anyone. Anyone. Anyone that believes in Him, committed to Him. Whosoever. Too many times, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I was waiting for um, an unction from the Spirit. And, and, I, and I, I have to say, I, I have been doing ministry for a long time now. When I think back on it, a long time and I have been to a lot of prayer meetings, a lot of church services, a lot of um, ministry in general. And far too many times, it's not all the time, but far too many times, religious people will gather together and they will talk about unity and they'll talk about peace and they'll talk about being together and they'll talk about They'll even talk about Jesus and his love. They talk about these things, yet they don't mention how unity and peace and love are attained. It just, it's, 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 it's just a mind-blowing thing. You're standing around praying, and you're talking about, we as Christians, we should be in unity, we should be in love, we should be showing that love to people. Woohoo! You're right, but guess what? There's something you missed out on. You didn't say how it was attained. You're not talking about the gospel. Maybe there's someone in that room that doesn't know. You act like it's a closed group. It's not. It's not a closed group. Not until, not until Judgment Day. The door's still open. And it just blows my mind that you wouldn't mention it. We mention the love of Jesus. We, we mention how great God is, but we don't mention how it's attained. 
Everything must begin with the gospel. It has to begin with the gospel. God's love is not limited only to the people in this room and the people watching. God is bigger than that. That big, big, huge theological $9 college, maybe $20 college words now. Omnipresent. He's everywhere. Omnipotent. He's powerful. Everybody whosoever, anyone who will repent and commit their lives to Christ has this free gift. It is salvation. The Bible tells us God who would have all men to be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth. I'll let you look that up in 1 Timothy. I'm not even going to tell you where it's at. I said that a few weeks ago. Somebody looked it up and sent me a text. I found it. Made my day. God has a reason, reason, reason. God loves us. He loves you. And he doesn't want any of you to go to hell. He doesn't want you to perish, to face that second death, to stand there in judgment day and not be written in the book of life. He doesn't want that. There is a story that Jesus tells in the, in the 16th chapter of Luke about a rich man who's fared sumptuously and was covered in scarlet. That means really good clothes, by the way. And there was a beggar at his gate. It was covered in sores. And the dogs licked his sores. I want you to know that in itself, you ought to read the Bible just for that story and go, ew, better than anything I can see on Netflix and Amazon right here. There's this man suffering at his gate. The rich man did nothing. Nothing for him. Nothing. And the day came. Rich man's dead. The beggar at the gate is dead. And he, the rich man is in hell. He is surrounded by... And by the way, careful, I don't believe it's a parable. Because Jesus used names. Every other time Jesus spoke a parable, yeah, it's a parable. It's a teaching lesson. But Jesus used a name. There's this man suffering in hell. He just wants for this other man to come that's in the bosom of the Father. Just let him bring up just a little bit of water. Just a little bit of water and dip it on my tongue. It's horrible here. Nope. Too late. It's too late. You had, you had a chance. While you were alive, you had a chance. The rich man was separated and tormented in the flame. But know this. So we've got to look at the Bible in all of it, all context. Every bit of it. You can't cherry pick. Romans 5 8. Romans 5 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Reason, love. God is love. Committed his love toward us in that while we were sinners, no matter how horrible the sin, remember, agape love. God loved the world. Curios, the word world means curios, the world, people. Unconditional love for those people mercifully offers everlasting life. Peace with him forever. The Bible says that God will eventually wipe away all of the tears. There's not going to be any more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. For the things, the former things have passed away. New creature in Christ. We are a new creation, free from the stain of sin. So the physical life, yes, it's going to end. The spiritual life continues free from sin. Reason God is love. There's a book I read in, in one of my missions classes years ago called Operation Peace Child, and it's written by a uh, famous missionary by the name of Don Richardson. And he went, and I don't, I have no idea, I would have to have a map. You can look it up later. Uh, he went to a group of people called the Sawi people, and they were in a place called Irian Jaya. I don't, I do not know where that's at. And came to understand salvation 
through, these people came to understand salvation through Jesus Christ. They, they, for months, him and his family were trying to figure out a way, praying about a way to communicate the gospel to this group of people. And then they found a key. God gave them a key, gave them an understanding for something that they've been praying for for months. See, every demonstration of kindness that was expressed by this group of people uh, they too were split, apparently, was regarded as suspicion. It's always suspicion. Except for one thing, one act. If a father gave his own son, if his father gave his own son to another family, to another person, his sacrificial deed showed that he could be trusted. He would give his baby to another family, to another man. That was the sacrificial deed where he could be trusted and anyone who touched that child was then brought into a friendly relationship with that father. That's, that, was their, that was their way of doing this. And then these people, these Saudi people, were then taught that in a similar way, God's Son, God's beloved Son, could bring them eternal peace. God is love. He gave His Son. And when you have eternal peace through God's Son, you have everything. You don't lack nothing when you have Christ. You lack nothing when you have Christ. You lack nothing when you have Christ. Final verse and final point this morning is verse 17. This is another one you ought to know by heart. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Not to condemn, but to save. So point number three, reason. The world needs saving. Can I can I be in, would you all be in agreement with me this morning that the world needs saving? Amen. See that word there, world, is that's that Greek word I said earlier, cosmos, means people. People need saving. Because when it's done, judgment is the final act for those who have not accepted God's love. That's it. Like, like the man in the flame, the rich man, looking up at Lazarus. Great chasm between them. That's what Jesus was trying to say. That's the, the final, that's it. God sent Jesus to save, and since God loved the world, there's no one, no one is immune to God's saving grace or does that, does that click at all? No one. Absolutely. I want you to think about the most horrible person you can think about right now. I don't, in fact, I know some of you, and I know who you're thinking is the most horrible person. At least I can get within your top five. The most horrible person you can think of in the world right now, if they are breathing the air that we're all breathing right now, they are not immune to God's saving grace. They are not immune. Salvation is available to liars and to thieves and to drunkards and drug addicts and adulterers and prostitutes and murderers. Whosoever. That all-encompassing word whosoever. All they got to do is repent and accept it. If God would save someone as horrible as I am and was, he'll save anybody who will humble themselves and accept their mercy. If you go back and look in the Old Testament, I, I'm still studying on that, but you go look back. When I told you earlier about Isaiah, the next step was that was that Judah was taken over by Babylon by a man named Nebuchadnezzar, and he wasn't a great guy. But Nebuchadnezzar spent about seven years 
eating grass because he said something he shouldn't have. But I want you to know at the end of that seven years, Nebuchadnezzar knew who God was. I don't know if that meant salvation for him. I really, I can't answer that question. That'd be a great study. But listen, he was still alive. He was still breathing. And as horrible as he was, and the murderer, I'm convinced he was a murderer. You don't throw people in a furnace to be burned alive without being a murderer. He knew who God was at the end of that. He knew that there was only the one God. Anybody, anybody who will humble themselves and accept his mercy can and will be saved. Let me share with you what mercy looks like. There's a passage in the, in the book of John, a little further on, I believe it's in the 8th chapter. A woman was taken in adultery, caught red-handed, probably more than likely a prostitute, temple prostitute. It was amazing that three preachers, I think it was three, not sure, brought her in to Jesus to try to trick Jesus while he was teaching. Oh, look what we found, Jesus. We found a, an adulteress. Should we, should we stone her to death? Should we kill her? I have a feeling they were wondering what he was going to say because he'd been preaching love and mercy and grace. Because the rule was you committed adultery, you got stoned. And I don't mean in a fun way. I mean in a real bad way. And, all of, and he simply looked up and said, all of you that are without sin can cast the first stone. And they all left from the oldest all the way down to the youngest because they knew, they knew exactly what they were doing. And so he asked her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And he said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. If Jesus did not condemn, then neither do we. We got no right. I don't care how wicked a person is. I got no right to think of, say it, act on. Don't even have the power. Condemnation is not something we do. If Jesus didn't condemn, then we do not either. While he was on that cross, I told you earlier about how hideous that was, hanging up there, just grasping for breath, lifting himself up on that, that little pedestal. His feet were on because the way they had him stretched out, they had to press themselves up to get a breath in their lungs or they would just die. They would suffocate. Gruesome way to die. Gruesome. Nailing him to that cross. What, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. He asked forgiveness for those who had beaten him beyond recognition, about to kill him, shove a spear in his side. If Jesus asked forgiveness for his persecutors, that's what we do. We ask forgiveness and we forgive. Now we need an application. You know, you can't just enough. It's not enough. It's not enough just to hear the word of God. I told you earlier that Nicodemus had book knowledge. He had head knowledge. He knew the law. That's not enough. It's not enough to come to church on Sunday, worship and get all your warm fuzzy and feel good about what you did and go home and contemplate, oh, that was a nice message hearing about the love of Jesus. I'm really glad I'm saved. It's not enough. We have to act. We have to act. And our application comes from that 16th and 17th verse. God so loved the world. God so loved the world. We got to love that same way. 
We got to pray for that. We got to pray for that love. God, give me that love, that unconditional love, regardless of the sin that somebody commits. Pray that God would allow you, allow me to see that person and love them the way Jesus does. God gave His only begotten Son. Now, we're not going to do that. We don't have to do that. Jesus already did that. But the intent there is to give in the same way, and that is sacrificial. Give till it hurts. Forgive till it hurts. Forgive till it don't hurt no more. Love till it don't hurt no more. Give with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. We should give as much as we possibly can spiritually, physically, financially, as, with everything that God gives us and blesses us with, we're supposed to use that to reflect the love of Christ. Do it sacrificially so that others can come and enjoy the same freedom in God that we have. And not to condemn. It's another application. Not to condemn. He sent him not to condemn, but the world through him should be, that might be saved. We don't have the power to condemn others. We just, we don't, we can't, but we are. What we should do is share the gospel. That is the first of every conversation out there. The very first thing for anybody who's willing to hear it. If they're not willing to hear it, we know a passage about knocking the dust off our feet, but that's a different thing. Anybody willing to hear it, we share the gospel. We don't condemn them. We know what they're doing is wrong. We know they need Jesus, but we share the gospel with anybody willing to hear because if you hadn't noticed, if you can't see the writing on the wall, the time is short and everybody, everybody needs Jesus. Amen. He reached out to us. He reaches out to those in need and that's what he expects us to do. The greatest gift that ever comes from knowing, that, that comes at all, is from knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is who God is. This is what He has done for us. This is who we are supposed to be. As a church, as a body of Christ, we got to be an example. Reason. Reason with people. As a body, as an individual, reason with people. Put the gospel at the front of not just, you know, I think I'll I think I'll squeeze this in here or there. Maybe this might work after we're done arguing about it. No, put the gospel at the front of the conversation. Put it right there at the front of the conversation. The answer to all conflict, the answer to all trouble, the answer to all trial, the answer to all problem is by sharing the gospel first. And if we did that, things might just look a little bit different. The next time any of us, and man, I do, I get rattled, I get hot sometimes. I want to throw things uh, at my computer screen, the things that I read and the things that I see and the stories and the attitudes. I get hot. And I shouldn't. Every time we feel rattled by what's going on in this world, by the circumstances, we need to reason. Reason. Reason by reading, share a gospel passage from the Bible. Start the conversation with a gospel passage from the Bible, not our own words. Not our own ideas. When something is going wrong, go to God's word. 
Go to the word that is the ultimate authority. And God's word is love. Go there first. Reason. Look for something in the situation that God wants us to see. Look past the, 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 the trouble and, 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 the, and, the, and the complication and maybe the anger. Maybe I'm so hot, God. Look past it, Lloyd. Look past it. It's, you're not supposed to be, you know, be angry, but don't let the sun go down on your wrath. There is an answer to this, brother, and it is reason. Look beyond it. Do I want you to be angry and out of control? No. There's a different way that God wants us to react. Look beyond the circumstances. There's something there. Reason. Somebody might need God's help. I can't help anyone without God. <coughs> I can't help anyone without Jesus. Yeah, I could give somebody a few dollars out of my pocket. I could give someone a ride somewhere. I can let somebody cry on my shoulder, and I do. I can do all of those things, but without God, there's no reason. Nothing I do means anything without God. Reason. Pray, pray, pray. Start the battle. If you feel like you've got to go to war, start on your knees. Start the battle on your knees. Pray for lost people everywhere. We've got lost people in our lives, amen? Do we all not know someone who's lost? We all know somebody who's lost. And we ought to be praying for them. They may not want to hear us anymore, but that doesn't stop me from praying. You cannot stop me from praying for you. Pray for lost people. And, and for those who are not lost, if we are no or not lost, maybe they're just backsliding. I've been a backslider, and I want you to know, theological, technical term, it sucks. Pray for backsliders. They know God, but they're just in this dumb, dumb place. Pray for them. Reason. First of the conversation. Always. First of the conversation. Always. Do you know Christ as your Savior and Lord? Reason. Do you know Christ as your Savior and Lord? If the answer is, I believe in God, that's not what I ask you. The answer is, I go to church, that's not what I ask you. See, that's the prayer meetings I was talking about. Oh, we love you, Lord. Lord, you're so wonderful. Lord, you're the healer. You're the protector. You're the guide. You are love. You bring unity. You bring peace. The end. That's true. Do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's a yes or no answer. You either know Him or you don't know Him. You know of Him, but you need to know Him. The first of any conversation, any trouble, any conflict, any battle, any issue is the gospel. We need to remember the call. The call is very, very simple. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the world. Amen. Amen. Go make disciples. Prayer meetings are awesome. Unity is awesome. 
Peace is awesome. All those things are great and wonderful. But if we don't have a reason, it doesn't mean anything. Go ye therefore and pray about what we are under God. Go ye therefore and, and, and talk about God. No, go ye therefore and teach. Make disciples. There are great opportunities today to make disciples. Everywhere you go, you can make a disciple if God so chooses to use you. But if you don't, if you don't use your reason, that he gave you, you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, and believe me, the Holy Spirit is talking to you to reason. Share the gospel first. The greatest gift we ever had on this earth goes beyond anything we can imagine. It is salvation. Salvation is the start to the conversation. Salvation is where peace and unity begin. It has to begin there. It has to begin there. Greatest gift we have is salvation, and God wants all people saved. And it only comes through Christ Jesus. Amen. To God and God alone be the glory. Amen. And, and so I'm going to practice what I preach. I should never walk away from an opportunity, whether everyone I know or don't know, to ask, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you know him? The Bible tells us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved with the heart. Man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they hear without a preacher? You can all go to John 3, 16. Be born again. God is love. Born again. God is love. The world needs saving. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you this morning to pray with me. If you never prayed anything like this before, just, just bow our heads. Even if you're online, bow your head. Bow your head with me. Let's just, God, just, let's just pray. As if I've never been saved before. If I don't know Jesus, pray with me. God, I know I need repentance. I need saving. I need that conversation in my life. I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I accept what he did for me on that cross of washing away all my sin so that I could come to you, so I can, that I can have a relationship with you. You are holy. I repent of my sin and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I pray this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, maybe you prayed it more. I don't, man, I don't know. Maybe you need to pray it every day until you know for sure. If you've never done that, if you've never accepted Christ is your Savior, and you're in this room, I'm going to ask you to come forward and proclaim Him. Make that the start of your conversation. You are new in Christ.
come forward and proclaim the name of Jesus. And if you did that online, send us a note. And we will rejoice with you and pray for you. And we're still going to pray for you. you got no choice in the matter. That's what we do here. God loves you, and so do I. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and finish the last song this morning. stand and sing this.
Whoo, sweet day today right here where we're at. I pray you're enjoying where you're at too. And I pray God's blessing you and keeping you and uh, and using you. Oh, Lord, it, 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 Lord, the world needs Jesus. So let me pray for you and we'll be dismissed. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, God, for that great salvation, that free gift of life that you've given us. And Father, we just pray that we glorify you and honor you and enjoy you. And that you put people in our path that need to hear about Jesus. Give us the words to speak when we do that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.